So this next writer is a pursuer of origins. In sparse, poignant prose, her work explores those quiet moments in life when things remain unsaid. Please welcome the divine Patricia Lee. Thank you everyone for being here. Year 1936. It was another morning in French concession Shanghai. Sunlight perforated the gaps between the shutter slats, casting whitewashed streaks in the otherwise darkened room. Beyond the high brick wall that surrounded the house came the barks of neighborhood dogs, the bells of hurried cyclists, the clatter of kitchenware, the hawks of old men clearing their sinuses, and the hollows of traveling food vendors. A soft knock on the door, the sisters did not stir. They were tired from the night before, the first taste of the insulated nightlife of Shanghai, their new home. The grand ballroom at the Candy Drum Gardens, the ghost men, the intoxicating sidecars, pink ladies and gin fizzes served in delicate glasses. The sisters, in their best silk chi pao, fitted, high collared with modest slits on the sides, clung close to their brother, feeling inadequate among the long shimmering dresses, bright red lips, strings of pearls, whiff of Chanel number no. five, and elegant feathered headpieces. The famous Clayton jazz band, made up of mostly dark skinned ghost men, played for the gay and dancing crowd. The sisters giggled and schemed about their next shopping trip to the tree-lined Avenue Hover for more stylish outfits, while their brother, who had been doing business in town on behalf of their father for the past several years, conversed in passable Shanghainese with his friends. Another group of men, all wearing silk suits and bow tie, visited their table. They smiled and slightly bowed their heads when introduced to the sisters. The tall, slim, and good-looking one with the long face spoke their dialect, Tiu Chu. He was from the same Chujiao district in Guangdong province. Like the sister, he also came from an industrialist family. His father owned a porcelain factory in Zhouzhou and several stores in Shanghai. He dazzled their young minds with animated descriptions of the glamorous Parliament Ballroom, the talk of the town, details of the surprise visit by Charlie Chaplin the month before, and the three-mile-long funeral procession of the young scarlet Run Lin Yu. He knew his leave for his hometown in several days could be treacherous due to the Japanese occupation of the rest of China, but he merely mentioned that he would like to see the eldest sister again when he returned. The eldest sister was flattered. Her eyes beamed with delight. She had thought her world was going to change, but had not anticipated how. He, the long-faced man, would soon call after he returned. The dancing would continue, followed by the wedding and the children. She had never thought that the French concession Shanghai would be governed by anyone but the French, or that she and her long-faced husband would flee to the fishing village called Hong Kong, or that the porcelain business could fail, or that she would be driven to leave her marriage and her daughters. One of the sisters finally awoke, answering to, answered sleepily to the soft knock on the door. The maid half her age entered, carrying a tray with two bowls of soup. She placed it on the vanity inlaid with camel bones and mother of pearl and handed each of the sisters, now sitting in their bed, a bowl, of thick, a bowl thick with translucent fiber of swallow's nests. A delicacy believed to be rich in nutrients and good for the complexion. The hardened protein of the bird's saliva once hung high in tens of thousands on the cave wall along the coast of Indonesia in shape of shallow cups. Built during the breeding season by the male swiftlets in just over a month, they were readily plucked by laborers on rope ladders haphazardly strung. The maid returned with a kettle of hot water to fill the wash basin. The water cooled while the sisters sipped their sweetened soup, recounting the event from the night before, the jazz band, the pearls, the cocktails, the long-faced men whose father owned a porcelain factory. They giggled as they constructed their dream dresses, pulling lace sleeves and beaded necklines and jewel embellishments from dresses in the movies. By the time the maid returned to help them dress, the sisters had concluded that it was wonderful living in the French concession Shanghai. She was 16. Pop. Oh, father, wait, here's your food. I look at the bowl of steaming noodles and broth. It burns my fingers and I, have, I need to put it down. Where's father to take it from me? Don't drop it, don't waste food. 
The broth spills, but my fingers are not burned. Wait, it's cold. I look at father. I can't serve him cold food. I look at the bowl in my hand. I look at his heavy eye bags, his plump cheeks, and the loose skin around his neck. I look at the bowl of noodles instead. Not good enough. I turn to walk away. Wait, father says. He reaches over and takes the bottle of fish food from me. The bottle tilts over the tank and I say, wait, they have been fed today. They'll die with too much food. Father turns away from the tank and grins. He looks younger than he does in his wedding photo. His face is long, it hasn't rounded out yet. Wanna fight, he asks. No, I said. Come on, he says, throw, and throws a handful of lettuce at me. Wait, I squeal. Wait, I'm not ready. I ran to the room and quickly put the foot in the lunchbox. Wait, don't leave without me. Father turns the key in the ignition. I see four more lunchboxes in the back seat and say, I don't want to have children. That's smart, Father says, looking into the rearview mirror. They are expensive. He looks tired. I watch the trees and the house shrink. I offer to drive. Wait till you're old enough, Father replies. My fingers fidget on my lap, shaking off the silly comment I've just made. Just wait, it'll happen, Father says, shaking the jiffy pop, jiffy pop over the stove. And it starts to pop. And the silver foil expands. And the inside are slices of bologna we used to get on Sunday at the deli. Pop, pop. And I place them between slices of bread, pretending the sandwich was being made for me, and carried it in my lunchbox. Pop. And the Campbell cream of mushroom is boiling inside, which Father used to cook before he went to bed, but after he came home late and he'd let me stir it once in a while. Pop, pop, pop. Salted, not the sweetened kind I like from the cinema. I watch father shakes the ballooning foil on the stove. Wait, I hear myself cry. Pop, pop, pop. Father puts his arm around me and I hug his belly, bigger than the one growing on the stove, waiting for the popping to stop. Wait. The Red Silk Dress. The red silk dress elaborately embroidered with flowers sat quietly in the closet for the past three years. The red too loud, the length too short, the style too Asian, I tucked it away in the back of the closet upon receiving it. A firecracker amid varying shades of browns, blues, and grays. I wasn't sure if mom really intended it for my ceremony, or was it meant to compensate for the inspiring beige dress she mailed a month, early, a month earlier. Initially bought for my sister, but deemed too light for her complexion, yet too simple, too plain, and too flat for me to be married in. Layers of semicircle in beige and shades of blue lined the bottom, the hemline halfway up the thigh. Multiple times I had thinned my closet for the Salvation Army, and the red silk dress remained stoic in the back, of the, in the back along with the excitement in mom's voice over the phone after she bought it. She even brought my sister to the store to try it on. It fit her perfectly, which meant it should fit you as well, Mom assured me. It was an ambivalent assignment I gave her to get me a dress for the ceremony if she came across one, a consolation prize for being kept at arm's length during the planning process. The dress too dear to give away unworn, too ornate for my style. Sewn flowers covered the red silk dress, the style Mom prefers for special occasions, like the time captured in the family portrait hung above the fireplace. She sat in the middle of the chaise in her flowery dress, surrounded by us in muted colors, emitting dominance. The collar stood stiff and wrapped tightly around the neck. Knotted buttons marched down the side along the collarbone. A modern cheng sam, still too Chinese. When my sister brought out the red dress from her suitcase, I protested, I'm gonna look like a Chinese doll at the souvenir shop. You should have said no at the store. She raised her brow and looked at me with a forced smile. She was right. Carefully, I folded up the dress along the creases and put it away. Thank you.